Hello again and welcome back to English Today. This is DVD 17 and the fifth DVD of your upper intermediate level. And in this DVD, we'll begin with another two episodes of our story, That's Life, followed by our special TV programs, where our culinary experts will be talking about how to set the table. This will be followed by a discussion about e-commerce and about doing business on the internet. Then, in the grammar section, we'll study how to position adjectives in the English sentence and also look at some of the main differences between American and British English, all right? So, enjoy yourselves and enjoy your viewing. I knew it. It couldn't have been different. <gasps> but watch, watch out! Oh, God. Did you hurt yourself? Oh, no. You should watch where you're going. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. I'm used to walking into things. You know, I'm a bit absent minded. When I was a kid, I was always falling over. I was always covered in bruises. But, oh, excuse me now. The first full moon of the summer. Just wonderful. Hey, what's the full moon got to do with anything? What? No, nothing. Come on, please. Well, Tell me what you're reading. It's just a beautiful love story full of passion. It's a love story between a young lady of the nobility and a farmer. The girl's father wants her to marry the lord and is against the relationship. So he arranges to have the young farmer kidnapped and locked away in a secret room to die of hunger and thirst. What a sad story. Isn't yeah. it rather depressing? Well, oh, wait a minute. I haven't finished. The kidnapping happened on the first full moon of the summer. Just a moment before, the two lovers had arranged to meet. Legend says that every year on that night, the young girls return to look for her lover. Do you see? <laughs> what should I see? It's a legend. Don't tell me I should believe in such a stupid thing. Well, on the contrary, I think you should. This is the interesting part. This love story took place here, in this house. And tonight, there's the first full moon of the summer. Oh, this is so exciting. I know this holiday would bring some pleasant surprises. You must be mad. And by the way, where on earth did you find this book? Well, up in the Arctic. It must have been written by one of Paolo's ancestors. If I'd known that room contained some treasures like this book, I'd lock myself in there for the whole holiday. You shouldn't go nosing around everywhere, Michelle. Well, then you shall leave me alone, then. I'm going to get the others together now, and we'll devise a plan for tonight so we can look for the young girl's ghost. <laughs> Michelle, this house is home to the spirit of a young girl. And this young girl is going to appear to us tonight as a ghost. Don't make fun, okay? It's true. I read it in a book I found at home. And I can feel it too. There's a strange atmosphere, almost surreal. I think the only strange thing here is you. That's exactly <sighs> what I said. Okay, enough of that. Listen to me. This is the plan for tonight. When the moon's eye in the sky, we'll get some candles and go and look for the ghost. Paolo, didn't you know anything about the story? Well, my grandfather did tell me something about it. When I was a boy, I used to go looking for spirits with my cousins. And didn't you feel frightened? I know. It was a great fun. Sure, everyone knows ghosts don't exist. Oh, you're wrong there. You know, one night, we heard some strange noises. Someone was shouting, but oh, we were so scared. And we ran up to our rooms and my youngest cousin cried for two days. He was so terrified. Oh, what rubbish. I think you just invented the whole story. Okay, stop arguing. Paolo and I are going to look for the ghost tonight. Sandra, you're coming with us? Well, I don't really believe in these things, but if you're both going, well, why not? It'll be a bit of change from the other evenings. Mm -hmm. And... 
By the way, I'm quite curious to find out whether this ghost really exists or not. <laughs> Sarah, are you coming with us? Oh no, I don't believe in spirits and I don't do such stupid things. Oh. I'll just stay in my room and read. Oh, come on, Sarah. Don't be the easiest spoils point. Come with us. You'll see it'll be fine. Don't insist. I said no. God. That damn pub. She wouldn't be like this if it hadn't burned down. I know you're right. Well, just let's try not to let her problems get us down. Sandra, can you call Mike and Anne? And we'll tell them what's the plan for tonight. Okay. Ghost hunting under a full moon, yeah. Hi everyone, and welcome back for another lesson. Now, as you've been watching our story, That's Life, you've probably noticed that there are different Englishes, different accents, like British English, American English, Australian English, yeah? Now, you can often notice that from the accent. But we don't only notice the difference from the accent. There are also differences in vocabulary. And this is something that I want to look at with you now, especially between British English and American English. So we'll look at the screen and you can see the words written because British English and American English, when I meet, for example, an American person, I usually don't have any problems understanding. But occasionally, for, let me tell you this story. An American said to me once, he said, um, hey, do you have a moose? And I didn't know what to answer. He said, do you have a moose? Now, in the English language, a moose is either the dessert that you eat at the end of a meal, like chocolate mousse, or it's the animal with antlers that you see in Canada. So um, none of those things were appropriate for the situation that we were in. So I, I had to say, uh, sorry, what, what do you mean by moose? And for him, the moose was a mattress. You know, part of the bed that you sleep on, a moose was a mattress. So. I was just flabbergasted. I, I could never have guessed that a moose was a mattress. So let me show you or introduce you. Maybe you know some of these already, especially if you watch the cinema a lot. Some of the difference in terminologies and vocabulary between American and English, all right? Now, look at the screen. In British English, we talk about living in a flat, which is a small house in a condominium. So that's a flat. But the Americans tend to call that an apartment. All right. Then we in England have gardens, which are often attached to our houses or our flats. But in America, they call that a yard. All right, a yard. So in my backyard, you often hear. Then when you have rubbish, in, in England we put the rubbish in a rubbish bin, but in, American, in America rubbish is garbage, so they put their rubbish in a garbage can. So rubbish bin, garbage can. If I say in British English I'm going to town, the Americans will say I'm going downtown, I'm going downtown. Um, in England, walking along the streets, the part beside the street itself, beside the road, is called a pavement. But in America, that is called a sidewalk. Pavement, sidewalk. We put our cars in a car park, but in America, they call a car park a parking lot. Okay, parking lot. We, we in, in Britain, we drive on motorways, whereas in America, you will hear the word freeway or highway or even superhighway, 
All right, so motorway in Britain, freeway, highway in America. Then when all the roads come together, we call that in English a junction. But the Americans call it an intersection. Junction, intersection. When we are traveling in our cars, we go and we buy petrol. The Americans buy gas or gasoline. For us, gas is um, uh, a liquid air. So, gas, gasoline, in British English, is petrol. Okay? Then, um, in England, we go to the cinema. In America, they prefer often to use movies, go to the movies. Then, for example, if you go to a theater um, and you want to go to uh, the wardrobe, for example, and leave um, your coats, etc., very often in America, that is called the closet. So, wardrobe, closet. Then, uh, if you're in a restaurant, to begin with, we in England have a starter. The Americans have an appetizer. And this is very interesting. We, when you take potatoes and you fry them, and for example, you have it with steak, in English, those are called chips. The Americans use French fries. Now, in English, when you have a bag, for example, at a party, if you're having an aperitif, we often have nuts and what we call crisps. Now, crisps are very thin pieces of potato chopped up very finely and then um, cooked, usually in hot oil, and put in plastic bags. Now, we call those crisps, but the Americans call them potato chips. So it's very confusing. For us, chips is what you have with steak, and the crisps are the things that we, you have in the bag. All right? And one more thing. Um, in Britain, we talk about summer, winter, spring, and autumn, but often... In American English, you will hear autumn referred to as fall. So those are just a few examples of the difference between British English and American English. But keep noticing the differences, when you're, especially when you're watching films, because it really is very interesting, and it will help you in preparation for when you go to both countries. All right, so... Good to see you again, and I look forward to seeing you again in the next lesson. Bye. This is the abandonment. Yeah? Oh. I should never have got involved in this charade. I still can't believe you persuaded me to come along. Oh, come on, Anne. You'll have fun. You won't regret. Can uh, anyone tell me exactly what it is we're looking for? Mike, do you ever listen when people talk to you? We're looking for the ghost of a young girl. Legend says that when the full moons are in the sky, she returns here to look for a young lover. She walks up and down the secret spot where she used to meet him. And where is the secret spot? Well, we don't know. But Paolo told me that last year he'd heard strange sounds coming from this house. Huh, we can start from here. We're here. How can we possibly if we can't see anything in the dark? Don't worry. I know this place very well. Okay, silent. Otherwise, we're not going to hear anything. Did, did anyone ask Sarah if 
she wanted to come along with us? Of course we did. She isn't interested. She doesn't believe in go. <laughs> well, you know, you still should have insisted. It's not nice to leave her all by herself at night. Okay, can we please start searching again? Silence, everyone, and and let's continue. Well, to be honest, this place is kind of creepy. Uh, creepy, yeah. Guys, guys, wait for us. to the people who cross my path. What happens? A horrible death. You must choose between being burnt alive or being eaten by wolves. Oh, 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 oh my god. Oh, listen, Miss Lady Ghost. I think there must be some misunderstanding here. We're all going to leave now and let you look for your lover in peace and quiet. Right, everyone? Don't move an inch. It's too late. Your fate has been decided. Oh, I beg you, please don't kill us. I, I, I didn't even want to come. I, I, they forced me to come with them. I, really Be quiet! <laughs> now, all of you, close your eyes and put your hands up in the air. <laughs> and now... <laughs> Sarah! So, uh, so you were the ghost? Yes. I was in my room reading when I thought of dressing up and scaring all of you. And I must admit it was worth it. You don't know how funny you all looked. Your face is white with fear and your voice is pleading for mercy. I've never had so much fun. <laughs> yes, but you gave us all a big shock. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But if it's made the old sorry come back, then long live ghosts. <laughs> Do you believe in ghosts? I do. You know, once when I was teaching in England, I was in a mansion, a beautiful old house in the country. And they told me that every day in one of the rooms in the mansion, there was a breeze which passed through the room every afternoon at four o'clock. And they said it was a friendly ghost 
a, a she, a woman, who haunted the house every day she passed through the room at four o'clock on the dot. I believe in ghosts. They are all in Scotland and Britain, I think, <laughs> in general. Now, I want to do something with you in this lesson related to English adjectives. If you look at this bag, if you want to describe this bag, you could say it's big, you could say it's brown, it's, it's useful, it's casual. So these are a few adjectives which you could use to describe the bag. Now, the problem is if you want to use more than one or two adjectives before the noun, how do you order them? Do you say it's a big, casual, useful brown bag or it's a brown, big, casual, useful bag? That's the problem. Well, in English, there is an order, a specific order, which we're now going to look at on the screen together so that you can decide every time you're using adjectives what order to put them in. Let's take the bag. So look at the screen. The first adjective that we would say is the adjective of opinion. So adjectives of opinion are, for example, interesting, boring, fascinating, in this case, useful, okay, or even casual. Then we talk about the dimension or the size. So it could be big, small, thin, thick. In this case, the bag is big. After we talk about the age, is it new, is it modern, is it ancient, is it old? And I think we could say about this that it's a new more or less, a new bag. So, so far we have a useful, big, new bag. Then we talk about the shape. Um, this bag is square. It could be oval. It could be round. So we've got shape. Then we talk about the color. Uh, for example, pink, blue, light green, brown. After that, the origin. Is it French, English, American, Italian? Okay. And then the material it's made of. If it's wooden, plastic, woolen, cotton in this case. So, if we want to describe this bag using all those adjectives, it would become this. It's opinion. A casual Big, new, follow the screen, new, square, brown, Italian, cotton bag. <laughs> okay? Now, we don't usually put eight or nine adjectives before the noun, but if you do want to use three or four, then that's the order which you follow. And remember that in English, all adjectives go before the noun, not after, because in some languages you can put adjectives before the noun and adjectives after the noun. However, in English the rule is adjectives always before the noun. Okay? Great. So that's the lesson about adjectives and I'll see you very soon. Bye. Welcome to Cooking Today. Hi, Lisa. Good to see you. Good to see you again, Nancy. Lisa, tell us what you're going to talk about this time. I've chosen a letter in particular. I've received so many. Here we are. It comes from Lynn. Dear Lisa, you're the person I most admire in my life. Please help me. My husband has decided to invite his boss and wife for dinner, and I've no idea how to arrange a formal table setting. Husbands can be so insensitive. Well, dear Lynn, you don't need bone china, silverware or crystal to set an attractive table. Where does one begin? I'd start with a table covering. Mm -hmm. The ideal tablecloth for a formal dinner is a damask one or a cloth with delicate embroidery. Can it be placed over a bare table? You'd better place a protective padded cloth underneath. What do you think about placemats? 
They're acceptable for every occasion except formal dinners. And table runners, are they pretty? They are, and very trendy nowadays since they come in a wide range of colours. Now, tell us about napkins. They're usually sold as a coordinated set with tablecloths. She's not supposed to use paper napkins, I suppose. Oh, it's considered a bit crass. You can use paper napkins for picnics. Is a napkin ring necessary? Why not? Mm -hmm. In the past, each family member would have one, either of wood or engraved silver. Today, they're available in many materials and styles. Now, what about dinnerware? I think that a set of one-colour dishes would be very smart. Mm -hmm. Round plain plates, a side plate, and serving dishes are perfect. What about glassware? The best for formal dinners is a long-stemmed goblet of medium height. Lynn will need a mm -hmm. wine glass, a water glass, and a flute for champagne. And cutlery, how do you arrange forks and knives? Forks are placed to the left of the plate. Spoons and knives to the right with the blade facing the plate. At the top of the plate, you place dessert forks and spoons. Of course, carving forks and knives are necessary when serving roasts. I see. How do you feel about centerpieces? Well, a basket filled with fresh flowers would smarten the plainest of tables. You can also use candles. It's a real work of art. Yes, and a pretty setting makes food taste better. Thank you, Lisa, for this informative chat. It was a pleasure. Now, let's see which term Lisa used to talk about table setting. First of all, she said there are different kinds of table coverings. A tablecloth is what we use to cover the table with during meals. Placemats are individual settings for more informal meals. Table runners are long and narrow pieces of fabric which can hold several places. A centerpiece can be placed in the middle of the table, usually with fresh flowers as decoration. If you want to protect your table from stains or heat, you better place a protective padded cloth under the tablecloth. A napkin is what we use to wipe our mouths with while eating. Today, paper napkins are rather convenient, but don't use them when Lisa is invited. A napkin ring is a ring of different materials, fabric, wood, silver, which allows people to identify their personal napkin during family meals. Now, let's go to dinnerware or dinner service, also called crockery. All plates, side plates, or serving dishes used for meals. Glassware refers to glasses that can be wine glasses, water glasses, or flutes used to drink champagne. A stemmed goblet is a tall glass with a stem used in formal dinners. Cutlery, commonly referred to as silverware, refers to forks and spoons and knives. Serving forks and spoons are used to serve food from the serving dish. That's all for this time. See you again next week. It's the new frontier of retailing. It's revolutionized the way we do business and it brings in customers from all over the world. Of course, I'm talking about e-commerce. I'm Merrick Brown, and this is Let's Talk, the discussion program with our commentators, Tom and Marie. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Well, what are your thoughts on e-commerce? Do you buy things online? Of course I do. I always book low-cost flights, and I also buy DVDs and books on the internet, as most people do. I shop online not only for the convenience, but also to pay the lowest price possible on any given item. I used to visit different websites to shop around for the lowest price, but now that automatic comparison shopping is possible, my browser automatically shows me the prices for the same DVD at different online stores 
on the web. I can easily compare prices and choose which one to buy. Marie, did you know that you're a typical online shopper? In fact, 52% of online shoppers buy books, 41% buy leisure and travel items, including holidays and flights, and 40% buy DVDs and CDs. Well, Eric, online shopping is very popular today. In the UK, for example, 48% of people regularly shop on the internet. Did you know that economists put the value of online shopping in the UK at £2.26 billion and that the e-retail market is growing by 32% a year? Actually, that doesn't surprise me. E-commerce is having a huge impact on the way we do business. It's increasing markets, improving efficiency and effectiveness, and is transforming business processes. Tom, why are you so quiet? What do you think about e-commerce? Well, to tell you the truth, I'm very skeptical about e-commerce for many reasons. Uh, why exactly are you skeptical? Well, let's start with the issue of security. Credit card details can be stolen and it's possible to order goods from bogus companies, ones that don't really exist. There are also lots of scams to trick people into handing over their login details for online banking and then their accounts are emptied. So, according to you, buying things online is risky. Yes. Also, you can't be sure you'll get the goods you ordered and if there's something wrong with them, who pays for the goods to be returned? You do. Tom, I agree with you, but up to a certain point. There are some problems with e-commerce, but these problems aren't stopping people from spending more and more online. At the same time, e-commerce has many advantages for business people. Uh, could you explain some of these advantages, Marie? Well, it's cheaper for a retailer to set up a website than it is to rent a shop fit it out and pay someone to work there. Besides, a website has global reach, so customers can come from all over the world. Okay, okay, an interesting discussion. But I'm afraid, yet again, we've run out of time. Once again, I'd like to thank our commentators. Thank you. Thank you. And goodbye to everyone. And see you again next week for another edition of Let's the topic today was e-commerce, electronic buying and selling. More specifically, we spoke about e-retailing and online shopping. Retailing is the selling of goods directly to consumers. Consumers are the people who buy goods. Online means with the internet. So, online shopping is buying things on the internet. The e-retail market, that is the selling of goods online, is growing. Well, online shopping has its positive aspects and negative aspects. Marie said you can find the lowest price thanks to automatic comparison shopping. Automatic comparison shopping means your browser, the program you use on the internet, automatically shows you the prices of the same products at different online stores. An online store is a virtual shop on the web. The web is another word for the internet. With this kind of shopping, you don't have to shop around. To shop around means visit different shops to look for the lowest price. It's cheaper for retailers, people who sell goods to consumers, to set up a website than to fit out a shop. To set up a website means to develop a website. Notice how we say to fit out a shop. This means to make a shop ready for use. For example, add shelves, lights, mirrors. Tom, on the other hand, is skeptical about e-commerce. This means he has doubts. He says online shopping is a risk. There are lots of bogus companies. These are companies that don't really exist. And lots of scams. A scam is a trick to steal money from people. Again, we have run out of time. To run out of something means you have finished it. So, goodbye and see you again soon. Now let's watch the whole episode together. 
watch the subtitles carefully because the language points that we studied together are highlighted. All right? Enjoy your viewing.